Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the final session of an Oak mini series for forest landowners, uh, where today we'll focus on climate change. Uh, my name is Logan Johnson and I'm the Northeast Region Coordinator for the Forest Stewards Guild. Um, throughout the presentation, please feel free to use the chat window, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. Um, throughout the presentation, you can submit your questions, which we will save for the question and answer portion of the event for the last half hour. Um, I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Andrea Urbano, who is the uh, Central District Forester for the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, or Connecticut DEEP, uh, Division of Forestry, um, who will discuss our climate change topic today. Um, so, Andrea, you can go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you, Logan. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm just going to delve right in. Well, just so you know, I am um, a service forester, meaning I, I support private and municipal landowners throughout my territory, but I do have a background in uh, carbon forestry and climate science. So I'm very pleased um, to have the opportunity to shed some light on these dynamics taking place throughout southern New England's forests and, you know, specifically oak forests. So I'm going to just get right into some definitions. In the context of climate change, we can think of our forests in several different ways. One way is that forests provide us with the imperative function and benefit of uh, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and holding on to it. Uh, right now, Southern New England forests function as a carbon sink. So they hold or store more carbon than they release. This um, mitigates the effects of climate change, um, which is different from um, the other lens we can view forest street, forests in the face of climate change, which is adaptation. And, and that's what we'll talk about kind of in a later portion of this uh, program. So as I mentioned, forests store carbon. The amount of carbon stored in a forest changes over time and is influenced by several factors. Um, but they store carbon in several pools. Um, five to be exact, lies above ground vegetation, lies below ground vegetation, ostensibly just root biomass, dead above ground vegetation, so standing dead trees down coarse woody materials, leaf litter and fine woody materials on the forest floor, and then the soil. Many people confuse and um, incorrectly use um, carbon storage and carbon sequestration as the same terms, but these are two very different things. Sequestration is the process of removing carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. So it's really just the tree or vegetation's way of um, growing and maintaining themselves it's generally higher rates of sequestration, the amount of carbon physically being removed through photosynthesis is greater typically in younger forests following a disturbance, you know, reforestation um, or something like what you see in these photos here. And so that's just some context, um, but let's delve into climate science. So, Maybe you have seen this graph. It depicts data collected over centuries from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And really what you're seeing here is the correlation between rising atmospheric, you know, global temperatures um, as it relates to rising carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So there is scientific consensus that our global temperatures are increasing, climate change is happening, and it is directly related to really our behaviors and carbon emissions, not exclusively, but, but still directly. 
But this has different effects worldwide. In southern New England, it has really seasonal effects where um, our, our temperatures are rising disproportionately in the winter. Um, these data you see depicted here, the top graph, depicts temperature um, in the Northeast, the US Northeast, so from 1950 to about present day. Our temperatures in winter have increased over three and a half degrees Fahrenheit since 1950. And depending on climate um, or carbon emissions moving forward, this has the potential to increase another eight degrees by 2100, which is hard to imagine. Um, but if you look at the second graph, you know, the warming winters directly impacts the snowfall and cover we have in the winter. And actually, since 1950, we have observed um, a, on average, 20 day decrease of snow cover per winter and a decrease in depth of snow by 10 inches. Um, and so you might be thinking, oh, that's great. Less snow removal, less maintenance. I don't even have to fly to Florida in the winters anymore. But unfortunately, in the context of our beloved oak forests and really any forests, this can have some serious um, negative impacts on their ability to function and provide us with the imperative ecological, social, and economic benefits that whether we realize it or not, we all rely on. So um, many scientists have debated how these warming temperatures are really impacting our forests, particularly in the context of productivity. And by productivity, I really mean forest growth. Um, so on, on the one hand, with our warming temperatures, our, our, our warmer winters, we are observing a longer growing season, right? Like kind of spring starts earlier or winter starts later or both. So indeed, with that warmer growing season, there is um, more photosynthesis taking place which means potentially greater carbon sequestration and, and greater growth, rate, growth rates, and even the potential of carbon storage might increase. However, scientists are finding that this can actually be offset um, by increased respiration, which is also associated with warmer temperatures. So, and, and with these warmer temperatures, our forests and are more vulnerable to uh, late spring frosts and impacts from soil frosts, which do reduce forest productivity or tree growth. Um, and really, it, they are now erring on the side of, of these warmer temperatures and longer growing seasons are actually having negative effects. Um, the negative effects are offsetting the positive. I'm gonna delve into this lack of snow cover and vulnerability to soil frost a little bit deeper. So snow pack acts as insulation. Without it, we, uh, our, our forests and soil are vulnerable to frost. So here on the left side of this arrow, you see a forest with a good block of snow on top of it. To the right of that arrow, that snow cover lacks and instead you see kind of these jagged triangles which represent soil frost penetrating into the root zone of the trees. Why does this matter? Well, soil freezing damages biota, damages life. Specifically, it leads to root injury compromised microbial and insect populations, which are really important for soil health, wildlife, 
nutrient recycling, all of these things. And it increases respiration. This reduces air and water quality and carbon storage potential. So that's that mitigation piece. It reduces our forest's ability to mitigate or offset the effects of climate change. In fact, Templer et al. in 2012 found that this soil frost lack of snow cover dynamic is reducing carbon storage capacity in northeastern forests by over 15 percent. That's pretty profound. Um, I want to also just touch on the fact that frozen soils from lack of snow cover, well, lack of that insulation, um, can increase erosion. It can impede infiltration of water into the soil, export nutrients into streams, um, and have these kind of secondary ecological uh, impacts that would also affect our health and the health of our wildlife. So our forests are adapted to natural disturbances. Um, extreme weather events being one example of a natural disturbance. And really, um, I could talk about each one of these natural disturbances for the duration of this day. We obviously don't have the time for that, but it's important to know that these disturbances are drivers of change. They're really important drivers of change. We, our forests need them. We need them. But it gets a little more complicated under the lens of climate change and this modern era of this ex-urban landscape, in, especially in Southern New England, there's so much development, so much fragmentation, um, which really limits the ability of our forests to respond and recover to these natural disturbances um, like they would and have in the past. Um, climate change is increasing the frequency and intensity of these extreme weather events. So when you pair that with the dynamics I just mentioned, fragmentation, development, um, it's compromising our forest ability to be resilient. I'm gonna focus on drought because I think it is the greatest example that has the most observable influence in Southern New England, specifically our oak forests, um, even present day. So here you see data from the U.S. Drought Monitor. This is specific to Connecticut, but they have these data dating back to 2000 for every state. Um, the different classes or colors you see, they represent different classes of drought, like hurricanes, where zero is the least uh, threatening, let's say, and D4 is the most. Um, Connecticut had the longest duration of drought uh, in recent history or since 2000, let's say. Um, in 2016 and 2017, it lasted almost a full year. And within that time period, um, the most intense period covered almost 50% of Connecticut's land area. And this had really significant impacts on forest health, particularly because as you can see, on either end of that 46 week period, earlier in 2006 and 2015, and then also in 2017 and 18, we had repeated droughts. So what you see in this photo is Patchogue State Forest in Eastern Connecticut. This photo was taken in the summer. So everything you should see would should really be green because leaves would be in full, um, you know, fully leafed out. So all that grayness you're seeing is dead oak. And, and this is because droughts are among the greatest stressors on forest ecosystems 
partly because they often lead to secondary effects of insects and disease outbreaks on the stress trees. And of course, they could increase fire risk, but that's less of an issue in southern New England. So um, we had these years of drought, reduced our oaks, uh, it stressed the oaks, reducing their chemical defenses. But it also, obviously during drought, we have drier soil. So um, the, the soil-borne biological pathogen that naturally kind of controls gypsy moth populations was not doing so well in these drought conditions. So um, there were more gypsy moths. The oaks were stressed and couldn't defend against them as well. And then these stressed trees became very easy targets for our native two-line chestnut borer. So fast forward a few years and we have millions of, of dead overstory oaks in the Northeast, um, at least hundreds of thousands. Um, and, and so this is um, something we really need to think about in the context of promoting resiliency. And, I, and I'll get back to that. I'll circle back to that in the context of drought. There's another classification of natural disturbances. Disturbances. These are biotic disturbances. A great example is that of beavers. You know that uh, they, before human intervention, would clear chunks of forests, dam them up, change our waterways. You know that that's a form of natural disturbance. I'm going to just go into two examples of this insects and disease being one. Here you see Patchog State Forest, that same forest I just showed you the aerial photograph of, but from the ground level, all the dead overstory oaks. Insects and disease are expected to become more damaging under our warming climate as they are able to adapt more quickly to new climatic conditions, migrate more quickly to suitable habitat, and reproduce at faster rates than the host tree species. So as previously discussed, they become more problematic or have greater impacts on tree health when the trees are already stressed. And under our changing climate, trees are going to be more stressed. Our less severe, warmer, drier winters may also in impact and increase specifically insect survival and spread. This is particularly concerning with species like the hemlock woolly adelgid, balsam woolly adelgid, and southern pine beetles for tree hosts and ticks for us, uh, for our health, um, because those insects really need cold freezing temperatures over the winter to help kill the overwintering population. Um, so we might expect those to play a greater role in our forests over time. It's also likely that fungal pathogens will become more aggressive due to the longer active season and enhanced colonization under warmer and drier conditions. Now, Brian discussed herbivory, pretty extensively for sugar maples, but it is certainly playing out. Maples are 16 years old. <laughs> yeah. And I know I'm sitting down and you can't really see me, but generally speaking, depending on the growing conditions, a 16 year old tree should be much taller than I am. So, so deer are obviously affecting forest health. Um, let's say a wind disturbance were to come and wipe out these overstory trees. And if deer are, if deer pressure is still as significant as it, as it is now, what would be the future forest there, you know? So a warming climate or our changing climate 
will likely benefit deer. There's still some mixed feelings about this, but because the warmer temperatures might reduce the energy requirements for deer, however, the lack of snow depth um, increases winter foraging opportunities. And deer browsing, regardless of how climate change impacts their population, deer browsing pressure limits the ability of forests to respond to our changing climate. It prevents the opportunity for forests to adapt and to prove resilient. Um, so our landscape, our oak forests are already being threatened by this dynamic as well as invasive species. So you all probably know these invasive plants better than you'd like to, <laughs> but um, climate change is only going to exacerbate them as an issue. Um, for several reasons, they have broad environmental tolerances. They already have extended leaf phenology, meaning they break bud before our native plants break bud. The first thing you see, you can identify barberry from a mile away in March and April because it's like the only thing leafing out in the understory. So they have that extended leaf phenology. They have more effective exploitation of changed environments. And generally, they're just better at colonizing new areas. So, and those dynamics are totally exacerbated by extreme weather events. So, for example, in Connecticut, Japanese knotweed was not really that big of an issue or that apparent on our landscape until 2012 or whenever Hurricane Sandy and Tropical Storm Irene came in, flooded the rivers and with it carried its seed. So, so that our increased uh, weather events will probably foster the spread and abundance of these species. So our, our, our future climate will favor them. They are already competitively um, more competitive than our trees and native species. Climate change is only going to favor that. So in addition to that, just like with our forests, over the next century, we are expected to see the southerly migration of in plants. Plants that occupy the U.S. southeast will likely occupy the U.S. northeast, of course, first southern New England, um, over time, and, and that includes invasives. So these are just some examples, bush honeysuckles, privet, kudzu, of ones that we want to be on the lookout for. And invasive species, just why we care. They reduce forest health and resiliency by preventing tree regeneration, reducing species, and structural diversity. Uh, they're less beneficial for wildlife and they decrease larger biomass. And that's really important for carbon storage, for wood products, for wildlife, for everything. I know we have mentioned the word resilient. It's been talked about in early um, series presentations, earlier presentations. Fern provided a definition. My definition is that of the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. It is the capacity of a forest to respond to a disturbance by resisting damage or stress and recovering from that damage pretty quickly. A disturbance could be natural or human. It could be that extreme wind event, or it could be forest management of silvicultural harvest. This photo depicts what I view as a resilient forest, which is largely attributable to the management that took place uh, to help foster that resiliency. Now, res 
you often hear the term adaptive in the context of forestry and climate change and forest resilience. And adaptation in forestry is the adjustment of the system in preparation for or in response to climate change. So promoting forest resilience is one adaptive approach. It falls within a spectrum of adaptive approaches, um, or some folks call this adaptive silviculture, like what you see here. So on one end of the spectrum is resistance, trying to maintain the status quo, maybe keeping the forest you have as close to what it is now in the future. The other end of that spectrum is transition where you're really forward thinking, you're contemplating you know, the future climate and trying to foster a forest that will most that will do the best under those circumstances. One such example of a transition is facilitated migration. So maybe clearing an area of land or having a field and you plant some of those southern leaf species to ensure that they're already on the landscape, you know, preparing for that future forest. You can kind of look at this a different way where there's still that spectrum, this blue line on, on the graph depicts uncertainty in management. It makes sense to me where that transition, as you move closer to those transitional management practices, there's less certainty. Because, you know, we don't know how much carbon emissions we'll be emitting over the next 50 years. Maybe the southern migration won't happen in the way that we project it to, you know, as an example. But but the take home point here is that resilience, fostering resilience through management is kind of like the happy medium of adaptive forestry. It avoids putting any eggs in just one basket. Um, it's probably the most tangible for us as stewards. Um, to learn about and implement. Okay, so why do we want resilient forests? Well, let's make something very clear. Forests are inherently resilient. I mean, look out your d windows, think of, of your state's landscape. Connecticut is almost, you know, 55, 58% forested. There was a time upon colonization when we had almost no forests left. And since then they've grown and been cut and grown and been cut um, like a million times over. And, and they are still functioning and serving us quite well today. So they are resilient inherently. However, our dynamics have changed unlike you know, the early 1900s, mid 1900s, our population has spread, our development has spread, our forested systems are fragmented by roads and development. Um, they're inundated with invasive species and they are just not able to recover as well because of us. <laughs> so, um, and these climatic conditions, that is only going, you know, that trend is only going to increase. So it's our duty as foresters, as landowners, as lovers of the woods to, and people who rely on the woods for a healthy, high quality life, it's our duty to promote resiliency. But how do we do that? What makes the forest resilient? What makes the forest adaptable? Here, I mean, all the photos I've shown you to date have been of resilient forests, but look at A and look at B here. Do you notice any changes, any differences, I'm sorry, between A and B? What, which in your mind would be the most resilient? I'll tell you the answer is B simply because it has greater 
structural diversity. It appears to me to have greater species diversity. And, and by structural diversity, I mean it has the, the sizing, spacing, and arrangement of live and dead vegetation. It has skinny trees, fat trees, tall trees, short trees, shrubs, an understory, live trees, dead trees. In, the, in A, you see at least four deer browsing. There's like no understory there. The canopy is, is pretty homogenous. In B, there are clusters of an overstory. There are gaps in between. There's a, a lot of heterogeneity at every way you look at it. So that is what we are striving for. We're striving for B. I know I'm going a little over time, Logan, I'm sorry, just Bear with me. Sorry so remote B, which we can do quite easily. It all depends on these three dynamics. Forest composition, meaning what species are growing in the forest you're, you're trying to promote resiliency. Remember Fern in last week's presentation talked about how each species has certain tolerances to shade, to light, to disturbances. Those are corporations. The structure of your forest is an important consideration. And site conditions. What is your soil like? Rocky, dry, well-drained, you know, wet, um, nutrient rich is in a site that's prone to certain disturbances. These are things to inform your decisions. I'm gonna breeze through some examples. If you have a tolerant stand, a stand comprised of trees that favor shady conditions, American beech, sugar maple, Eastern hemlock, shade tolerant species tend to be less tolerant to drought. We know drought is is playing a bigger role on our, on our landscape, impacting our oak forests, and that is only going to increase under our change in climate. So if you have a shade tolerant stand or forest, you might wanna implement some management that promotes the um, establishment of shade intolerant species. So, um, doing single tree selection, so selecting specific trees of specific age classes, um, promote shade tolerance, and that will reduce resilience out. Unthin stands are more vulnerable to drought, okay? So thinking about structure, on the left tier, you have a picture of a sand that has not been thinned. And by thinned, I mean vegetation has not been actively removed. On the right, there's a photo of a thin stand. Now, both of these forests, in my mind, have structural complexity, which is a, an important part of resiliency. But if you look at the canopy, look at how much sky you see in the thin stand versus the unthin stand. Trees compete for resources. So if there are more trees competing, there's less water available for each one. And let's say there's a drought, it's harder. Those trees that are competing even more are more vulnerable to that drought. So this slide is looking at that structure on the sand level. We can blow that up to the landscape or larger parcel level where it's really a, a resilient forest in that context would have a very density throughout it because different densities of trees meet multiple adaptation strategies and approaches. So having single trees in that thin matrix provides a mature wildlife for habitat. Um, it reduces drought sensitivity, right? Because there's less competition for water, but those trees are more vulnerable to wind because they're not protected by their neighbors. Having clumps of untouched forests can serve as wildlife refuge, less vulnerable to wind disturbances, um, but maybe greater sensitivity to drought. 
learn and get that species diversity, benefit wildlife, and provides opportunity for maybe facilitated migration or other um, transitional approaches to adaptation. This is kind of looking at that at the ground level. I just want to note, I'm not getting into that, but with climate change, our habitat suitability is changing. So some tree species in southern New England are going to have a lack of suitable habitat for them. Some will have an increase, and there might be habitat suitable for new species, southerly species. This is all to say, in your woodlot, the, the key things to promote are continuity and complexity in both species and structure. And this can be done pretty simply, controlling invasives, and through a portfolio of both active and passive management options. Active management should emulate our disturbance regimes. It's critical to retain live and dead wood. Um, we have to try to control our, our deer populations and just of paramount importance, have a plan for your land now and in the aftermath of your life and keep that forest. And this will provide our forests with all the tools it needs to adapt to and recover from all the stresses associated with climate change. Okay, I'm sorry I went a little long, but I'm so excited to hear your questions and hopefully I'll be able to provide some meaningful answers. Thank you. Great, thank you for that awesome presentation, Andrea. I know I have a lot of questions and we have a few coming from the from the chat window. Um, I'd like to invite Christopher Riley to un, uh, share his, uh, his camera and unmute himself so he can join our panel here. While uh, Andrea is figuring out her audio, Christopher, uh, do you wanna introduce yourself to our, to our per participants? Sure, my name's Christopher Riley, I'm a, a forester and conservationist. I've got a practice called uh, Sweet Birch Consulting and I work some um, in Massachusetts and Connecticut um, while I'm based here in Rhode Island. I also do some work with the University of Rhode Island and um, enjoy you know, collaborating with um, other folks, uh, professionals and landowners across the region. I see some familiar names um, uh, on the webinar day. Great, thanks, Christopher. And as we give Andrea some time to get back into the room, um, I, I guess I'll just start with some of the questions that were that were already in there. Um, is there anything I can do to prepare my forest for drought conditions? Well, I'd say that you know, there's you you know you're you know working with what you you know what you have, um, but. Ha you know, some of the sort of classic, you know, good, uh, you know, forestry re recommendations are good, you know, climate recommendations too. So say having a management plan for your forest in which you, um, you know, you know, could have worked with a forester in doing an inventory and assessing what's out there in terms of tree species, you know, ha habitat, you know, other, other conditions. And then you know you know planning out management activities uh, over a period of time you know that can you know put you in a position to have a uh, more resilient forest or be you know more responsive when a disturbance such as a drought uh, or other kinds of disturbances um, take place. I think that's one one place to start. Great, thanks, Christopher and Andrea. Just since you're catching up, I asked Christopher the question: Is there anything I can do to prepare my forest for drought conditions? Mm. Well, I'm sure Christopher did a great job answering it, but I think it kind of depends on what you got going on in your forest. You know, what species are present. Um, as I said, those shade-tolerant species are less drought tolerant generally. 
so um, if you have a, a forest full of American beech and, and more shade tolerant species, you might want to do create some larger gaps, um, thin out the stand or, or forest, you know, in some ways that that promote some sun loving species and reduce competition for water resources. Just following up on that, I, I may add that um, just you know trying to you know you know match uh, sp you know species to sites where they're well suited. Uh, but if you're you know having species that you know like a lot of moisture or you know rich you know conditions and they're you know growing in dry and, and bony places, they're they're going to be hit particularly hard in a drought. So if you're doing some silviculture or forest management on your land, you might consider favoring species uh, that are better adapted to those conditions, um, especially as they may increase in the future. Well said. Great, thank you both uh, for your responses to that question. The, the next one we have is, can planting just a handful of Southern species in the clearing really be effective? With the deer pressure, I can't see planting and protecting very many individual trees. What species are recommended? Well, that's a really good question. And yes, of course, um, if you remember in that slide, and I can pull it back up here, there is inherent uncertainty in those in those transitional adaptive approaches. Um, so let me just pull this back up. So um, so absolutely, you are right that um, it might not work. <laughs> there, it might not. It would require some real thoughtful planning to increase the chances of it working, like caging, which we really have to do with anything we plant if we don't want deer to eat it, caging it while it grows, um, and, and practicing, you know, planting it in the right spot. But I, I do think that it might be something if you're interested in that worth contacting your service forester or, or for that you know to, to gain their insights on if you have a site appropriate for that. But that is kind of a newer, I shouldn't say new, but there are current experiments taking place throughout the Northeast um, to determine the viability of that as an option and to see how well some species do. So in terms of which species to present, I would say, I mean, to plant, I would say stay tuned because we will have more data on that based on these, um, you know, the results of these exper experiments. But a good place to start would be maybe some of these trees you see um, on the new column of, of this slide. I would echo what pretty much anything that yeah yeah go ahead no go ahead Chris. Sorry, I was echo Andrew what you're saying uh, in that you know the you know part of a you know a broader strategy not sort of, you know just you know going and, and you know planting some seedlings you know, in in the woods and you know I think in many cases you know protecting them with you know fencing or you know, Trying to hide them around, you know, slash or, or you know, even using you know slash walls in, in some cases, uh, you know, can work. Uh, but being you know thoughtful about you know where you're 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 planting them, uh, you know, probably would be some of the more uh, you know challenged sites uh, on your on your wood lot that are experiencing difficulty, you know, in, in current conditions. And you know, it doesn't you know need to be limited to just, you know, future adapted species too. Of course, you can also plant, you know, native species that are well suited to those sites along with them or, or that, you know, may continue to do well. And for those of you who are, you know, particularly in interested in species uh, in the chat, I posted a link to uh, projections for individual species that um, some people find uh, really interesting thinking about that if you're one of those folks. 
Great, thank you. And a follow up to, to this topic, um, with this assisted migration, is there any chance that these species will become invasive as they become introduced to the area? I mean, there is uh, in all likelihood probably not, but I guess it depends on what, you know, you've, uh, geez, let me think about this. Probably not because like Southern red oak functions just as an example in the Southeast, almost like our Northern red oak functions here. It doesn't have invasive tendencies there. Um, so I would not expect it to have invasive tendencies here. W would you agree with that mindset, Chris? Like it, or it doesn't, these are not invasive trees um, in their growing site now. So if our region becomes more like that region, I would not expect them to function as invasive. General, I, I would agree. I think the big difference is the, um, you know, these are species that are already, you know, next door that are, you know, slowly projected, to, you know, to move into our region uh, instead of a, taking a, a species that's, you know, come from another continent, perhaps in a, in a you know, a packing crate or, or something like that. So I think the risks are, are much lower. Um, you know, there, there are, you know, some you know people who you know like to be you know more exp experimental or, or you know push the envelope a bit more. There's some you know differences of opinion about the you know the species you know black locust I've seen on some some lists, which others would would, would avoid. Mm -hmm. But I think most of them are, um, are are not too controversial, and I myself you know would. Um, suggest that landowners could feel comfortable with them. Uh, but there is some inherent uncertainty, certainly, in uh, doing something new. Great, thank you both. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, thin forests dries out as more solar energy reaches the ground, does it not? Thin forests out, okay, so to a certain extent, there's like a threshold maybe is the word I'm thinking of. Like if you were to do a silvicultural clear cut, which is where you remove uh, close to 100% of the overstory trees, this is done for wildlife habitat, this is done to get some loving trees um, established. That is when um, there's really an issue with soil moisture, right? Because there's, there's nothing kind of keeping it moist. There's um, a lot of evapotranspiration or, or whatever taking place. In a thin forest, that is not really happening um, because there's still a lot of vegetation there. And ideally in a thin forest, one of the benefits of it being of, of, of removing vegetation is that the remaining vegetation can grow better, more vigorously, bigger. Um, maybe even some seedlings can take off, maybe not. Um, but, but the thought is there's still enough vegetation in that, in that type of management um, that would maintain forest, you know, available moisture and have fewer trees competing for that moisture. Yeah, I would go along with that. And I think on, you know, on a given, given, you know, site, um, things, you know, may dry out more, you know, generally as a, as a region, our, you know, our, our forests are still, you know, quite moist and the drought and you know fire susceptibility is you know a lot less than you know parts of the American West say and you know there are you know trade-offs and all of these different things we're thinking about um, and if you want to create better conditions for some some trees to grow and to have um, you know habitat that different species like with 
gaps and canopy openings, you know, room for early successional species um, and some variety across the landscape, you know, then you are going to need to have some openings, whether they're created by natural disturbances or, or human intervention. Um, but it's all, all something to think about um, on a landscape perspective. Thank you. And kind of sticking on this uh, drought topic, wasn't the summer of 2016 to 17 also complicated by a series of gypsy moth defoliation like shown at the Patchogg forest slide? Um, and I have a follow up question to this that can tie a lot of it together. Yeah, I mean, I think I may have talked about that. I'm sorry if I didn't. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Uh, yes, to, the way I think of it is first came the droughts, then came, you know, the outbreaks of gypsy moth, then came the two line chestnut borer. But certainly, I mean, that's a very cookie cutter way of thinking about it. Certainly, there was overlap with the gypsy moth outbreak and the drought. Um, I think the outbreak was as significant in that year as it was because the soils were so dry and that my myga fungus, that soil borne pathogen that, that kills gypsy moth, um, there wasn't enough of it, you know, it wasn't being fostered in, in, that, in those dry conditions. Does, does that answer your question? And Christopher, do you agree with what I just said? <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things that you're seeing as, um, with the climate change, um, starts to see you know more different stressors, and then they can interact with each other, and there are you know compounding factors that get stacked, and you can have effects that um, we don't fully understand yet, uh, and, and just you know how far they'll they'll go is is unknown, and that's that's one of the most significant concerns to some forest scientists and, and managers as we see this play out. Great, and that's a great segue. That question is a great segue to this, this kind of final overarching question that we have is how do all these factors, drought, gypsy moth, invasive plants, deer browse, interact? I mean, are they all bad everywhere in Southern New England? Yes, I mean, no, okay, so drought isn't, <laughs> there are, drought is playing a bigger role shaping our landscape. It will continue to under our changing climate. We are going to have still lots of precipitation, but it will be coming in these like intense rainfalls. I mean, I think we're already seeing this in these intense rainfalls or storms with a, a significant dry periods in between. There are certainly regional, you know, variants to this. There are wetter sites that are less affected by drought. And I've seen this in Connecticut, Rhode Island and Mass, where some oaks just really weren't affected um, by gypsy moth as much or even the drought because the site was wetter, you know. Um, so, so there are there are differences, but but to, I think your question is: Do all of are all of these pieces of the puzzle working together to create a very big problem? Is that the question that uh, did I hear? So the answer is yes. As Christopher said, you know, we're having kind of these confounding effect, effects. So one thing promotes another thing that promotes another thing you know so so yeah i i think unfortunately it's kind of how it's happening so we do have to do our best to control those invasives there's not much we can do about these extreme weather events other than our part to reduce our carbon emissions and live a little bit more sustainably off off this earth and, and rely on more renewable resources. I don't know, Christopher, I'm not answering this question well, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer to you to... Uh... Well, 
cover. There's there is, there is a lot to think about. And I think that climate change, you know, is an overarching stressor. You know, some some of these things, you know, drought certainly, or you know, introduced species are not new. They they may be becoming at us at a, at a faster rate. Um, I think as you know, foresters or conservationists or landowners, one of the things that we can do is, is try to become informed about it. And just as in so many other areas of life, trying to, uh, you know, control or uh, manage, you know, what we can um, work on and at least monitor or, or be aware of, you know, what we can. So um, if you are uh, you know, know the, the land and you're, you know, aware of, um, you know, where the invasive plants are, for example, or, you know, areas of, of a property that might be susceptible to drought, you know, then you can start to think about how you uh, might uh, manage those uh, areas or um, could be particularly vigilant about changes. And you could also think about uh, areas on, on a property where you might take a more defensive uh, approach to climate change and trying to uh, maintain the current conditions as long as you, you can, you know, where things are relatively healthy or on more stressed sites, um, you might need to consider promoting some of these, you know, future ad adapted species and as, as much as you like uh, the composition that's had in the past, uh, you know, accept that it's most likely going to look a bit different uh, in the future and sort of trying to uh, make lemonade out of lemons sometimes, um, you know, when you're given a gypsy moth uh, infestation or a windstorm or something like that. I do think there are opportunities uh, in uh, climate forestry as well. I just want to piggyback off that just very quickly show you this photo again of those dead oaks. If you look closely in this forest, there is an understory. Like this is a perfect example of resiliency. There was drought, gypsy moth, whatever, almost 100% overstory mortality. But look at, at what is, there is something native there, though it's probably just black birch, but still, there is something native that will come up and, and thrive now that there's an absence of those oaks. If that was all invasive species, the forest is gone for now, right? So, um, so, so sometimes nature helps itself, you know, it keeps, it, it, that's where these, these forests are already adapted to these things. It's just where we can, where it's feasible, what makes the most sense for your woodlot, for your needs and interests, um, the things you can do to make it so that if something like this were to happen in your woodlot, you would not be lost without a forest. I mean, that's kind of an extreme way of framing it, but um, yeah. Well, great. I'm sure we could keep you online all evening to talk about this topic. So um, I'll I'll spare us the rest of the evening and uh, move into our closing closing comments. Um, first, I want to thank uh, thank our presenters, Brian Hawthorne, who hosted our uh, wildlife session from the Mass Division of Fisheries and Wildlife or Mass Wildlife, Fern Graves, who did our forestry session um, with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, and of course Andrea Urbano of the Connecticut Department of Environment energy and environmental protection. Um, Connecticut Deep, who did our climate change session today, and a special thanks to Christopher Riley, who has been a great panelist, the, the two sessions we had him for. Um, and you, the participants, we really appreciate you sticking with us through this series, and we hope you learned a lot and enjoyed your, enjoyed your time with us. Um, and as always, we want to close by thanking our partners who, without none of this work, would be possible. It takes a lot of, lot of groups to get great work done on the ground in the forests of southern New England, and we're, we're proud to work with all of you. So thank you. Um, and we will wrap up the session now. So enjoy the rest of your evenings.